now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Crime drama this hour, we go back, uh, what is it, 69 years to April 27th, 1954, an episode of Dragnet entitled The Big Lift, and we thank you for tuning in on this Sure Happy It's Thursday, 27th day of April, 117th day of the year, 248 days remaining. The British Parliament passed the Tea Act on this date in 1773, designed to save the British East Indian Company by granting a monopoly on the North American tea trade. In 1805, the U.S. Marines and Burbs attacked the Tripolian city of Derna, the shores of Tripoli, part of the Marine Corps. Him. 1947, on this date, Babe Ruth Day across the country, at Yankee Stadium, the Bambino, who was dying of cancer, spoke for the last time to his fans. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You know how bad my voice sounds. Well, it feels just as bad. You know this baseball game of ours comes up from the youth. The only real game, I think, in the world. Baseball. you got to start... From way down the bottom, when you're six or seven years of age, you got to let it grow up with you. And if you're successful and you try hard enough, you're bound to come out on top, just like these boys have come to the top now. Thank you. Give away, sir. Ruth died on August 16th of 1948 at the age of 53. In 1967, Expo 67 officially opened in Montreal with a large opening ceremony broadcast around the world and it would open to the public on the next day. Uh, Let's see, in 1974, 10,000 marched in Washington calling for the impeachment of President Nixon. In 1994, the first democratic general election in South Africa in which black citizens could vote. And in 2018, Pam Mum Jam declaration signed, declaring the end of the Korean conflict. Passing away on this date in history, Edward R. Murrow. This is London. At the moment, everything is quiet. Off to my left, far away in the distance, I can see just that faint red angry snap of anti-aircraft bursts against this steel blue sky. Now you'll hear two bursts a little nearer in a moment. There they are. Murrow, quite the journalist, passing away on this date in 1965 of something he investigated, lung cancer caused by cigarette smoke. Uh, William Colby, director of the CIA, also passing away on this date, as did trumpeter Al Hurt, singer Vicki Sue Robinson, and pro wrestler, trainer, football player, and also promoter Vern Gagne. All those folks passing away on this date. This is the birth date of the man who invented the dits and the dots, uh, Samuel F. B. Morse. Uh, inventor born on this date, as was President Ulysses S. Grant, Woody Woodpecker, cartoonist and creator Walter Lanz, actor Jack Klugman, Coretta Scott King, the wife of Martin Luther King and civil rights activist, Casey Kasem, Sandy Dennis, actress, comedian Judy Carnes, sock it to me, and uh, the uh, one of the voices of the main ingredient, Cuba Gooding Sr., the uh, B-52's Kate Pearson is 75. From Kiss, Ace Freely is 72. Shayna Easton still taking the morning train at 64. And from Doctor Who, Jenna Coleman, 37. Those just a few of the people who celebrate the 27th day of April as their birthday. And if this happens to be your birthday... 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday to you. Ah, thank you, Mrs. Miller. We go back 69 years to April 27th, 1954. Jack Webb starring in Dragnet. That's up next here on this Thursday edition of Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox here on your favorite radio station. Before Jack Webb created Dragnet with the assistance of L.A. Police Department uh, Detective Sergeant Marty Wynn, whom you'll hear credited a lot in these shows, he had a variety of interests in uh, radio. Uh, He did a comedy show, believe it or not, on ABC Radio, The Jack Webb Show. He did have a one-man show on the weekends called One Out of Seven on KGO, in which he dramatized a new show from the previous week. We've aired the program where he goes after, uh, well, I shouldn't say goes after, he reports the uh, the blatant racism of uh, Senator Bilbo uh, and, and how that dramatically affected the U.S. Uh, in other shows, he did Pat Novak for Hire on... Uh, uh, a radio show from KFRC, a uh, man who worked as an unlicensed private detective. He also was on uh, Johnny Madero, Pier 23 on Mutual, Jeff Regan Investigator on CBS, uh, also Murder and Mr. Malone and Pete Kelly's Blues. And that gave was quite uh, a, a nice uh, layout there. Now, he also appeared in three films, Sunset Boulevard. He also appeared in The Men, Marlon Brando's first feature film, and uh, the film noir Dark City, and he co-starred with Harry Morgan in that series. But uh, then in 1949, Dragnet came to pass, and it would be on NBC Radio, Uh, from 1949 to 1957. It was on NBC television from 1952 to 1959. Barton Yarborough played uh, Sergeant Ben Romero, his partner. After Yarborough's untimely death, Ben Alexander joined the cast. And today we're going to hear an episode from April 27, 1954, Dragnet on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, episode entitled The Big Lift. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to forgery division, shoplifting detail. An organized gang of thieves has started operating in your city. In spite of the precautions taken, the thieves are still working. Your job, stop them. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, September 20th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of forgery division, shoplift detail. My partner's Frank Smith, the boss of Chief of Detective Stad Brown. My name's Friday. We were on our way out from the office, and it was 9.45 a.m. when we got to the eighth floor of the Whitfield Department store. Security office. Yes, sir, can I help you? We'd like to see Mr. Dunlop. I believe he's expecting you. Your name? Joe Friday. Oh, yes. You want to go right in? Thank you. Thanks, man. This door here? Yes, go right in. Come on in. Hi, Jerry. You know Frank, don't you? Sure, how's it going? Hi, Jerry. You boys want to sit down? Thank you. I'll have the girl sent up. Okay. Yes, sir? You want to have Miss Evans sent up, please? 
Miss Evans, yes, sir. I'd like to ask you guys a favor. What's that, Jerry? Poor kid thinks this whole thing is her fault. I'd appreciate it if you could take it easy on her. Well, we'll do our best. Sure. What'd they get away with this time? Oh, here's a list. Thanks. Here's a copy for you, Frank. Oh, thanks. You got any idea when they were in? It's hard to tell for sure. We're open Friday night, and then Saturday's a pretty rough day. It wasn't until after closing we found it. I figured they either moved in late Friday night or early Saturday morning. Miss Evans' girl discovered the thefts, did she? No, no, she didn't know anything about it. The stock clerk found it. He was running through the inventory to replace the coats and suits. Noticed there were several that couldn't be accounted for. He called me. Mm -hmm. Evans' girl's in the department. I talked to her this morning. Looks like she waited on the pair. she able to come up with any kind of description? Yeah, I think she'll be able to help us. Oh, excuse me. Yes? Miss Evans is here. Oh, send her in, please. Yes, sir. Come in. You wanted to see me, Mr. Dunner? Yes, would you come in, please? Yes, sir. Oh, Miss Evans, this is Sergeant Friday and Officer Smith. They're from the police department. How, How are you doing, Miss? Hello. I, I don't know why you want to see me, Mr. Dunlop. I told you I didn't know anything about them. I told you. you Gotta believe me, I didn't have anything to do with them. I never saw them before. Now, you just sit down, Miss Evans. Thank you. Now, the officers are here to just talk to you. They want to ask you a couple of questions. There's nothing wrong. You mean I'm not going to lose my job? No. Really? You're not going to fire me? We never even considered it. I don't know how to thank you. My first job and to have a thing like this happen. Sure, appreciate it. Anything you want to know, I'll tell you. You just ask, I'll tell you. All right, Miss Evans. Have you any idea who might have stolen the merchandise? Well, didn't you tell them what I said, Mr. Dunlop? Well, I thought it would be better if they heard it from you. Oh, I see. Well, I think I know who they were. I've tried to remember all the people I waited on, everyone. There's only two that stand out, like they were different. How do you mean different, Miss? Well, they didn't seem like the other customers. You know, like they really wanted to buy something. Yeah. They just wanted to look around. I could tell they didn't really want to take anything with them. We had a course on that in school. How to tell if a customer really wanted to buy. Mm -hmm. That was one of the class problems, to sell a customer who didn't really want to buy anything. Yes, ma'am. About these people, what was it they did that makes you think they might have been the shoplifters? Well, first, the way they talked. I was trying to wait on other people at the same time, and they kept me showing them all kinds of things. It took me almost a half an hour to clean up after they left. There were two people, is that right? Yeah, a man and a woman. Can you give us a description of them? I told Mr. Dunlop all about it. You want me to go over it again? I've got it, Joe. I'm having a type for you now. All right, fine. You want me to talk again? Well, we'll check it with you, yes, ma'am. What kind of things do these people want to see, ma'am? Oh, just about everything at the counter. They had me so mixed up, I didn't know what to do. I told you I was trying to wait on another customer. A woman who wanted to buy a suit, I kept trying to take care of her. She finally left. These two were causing so much trouble. Every time I left them, I couldn't even take care of the woman. She got mad and left. I don't really blame her. You know, Mr. Dunlop, there really should be more people up there. Only three girls, and when we get busy, there just aren't enough to go around. Lots of customers walk out. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see what we can do. Lots of times they walk out without buying something because there isn't anybody to help them. Mm -hmm. This woman who walked out, could you describe her for us? Oh, you bet. She was real nice. Had a lot of patience. Kept waiting for me to go back and take care of the troublemakers. Never said a word. Well, can you tell us what she looked like? Well, I'd say she's about... 35. It's hard to say for sure. She took real good care of herself. You know, hair all nice and good makeup. Not cheap, like nice hands and a manicure. Was she carrying any packages when she came in? Do you remember? Mm, gee, I gotta think about that. I don't think so. Oh, you know, a couple of paper bags, like from the notions department. Maybe face cream or cologne, things like that. No large boxes? No. I don't see why you're so interested in her. The other two were the ones who caused the trouble. They're the ones who must have taken things. Why are you asking about the lady? How was she dressed, you remember? Oh, just beautifully. Had on a gray suit with large lapels. Kind of peplum that came out like this. Rhinestone buttons, beautifully good taste. She wearing a coat? Mm-hmm. Long. Had a stand-up collar, a real full skirt, tight bodice. Where was she looking at the suits? Over by the counter. She'd hold them up, you know, in front of the mirror. She knew what she wanted, looked at the material, the way they were made. She'd have bought if I could have spent a little time with her. She liked the merchandise, liked everything I showed her. Mm -hmm. How many things did you take off the racks for? I guess she looked at a dozen styles, you know, a dozen real high-style suits. That seemed to be all she was interested in. You don't think she had anything to do with the stealing, though, do you? Well, looks like she was the one who did the actual taking of the merchandise. The other two were there to keep you busy. I can't believe that. She was so nice, never seemed to get upset, even when I couldn't spend more time with her. Real nice. Didn't get upset at all when she couldn't find what she wanted. I'm afraid you're wrong there. Hmm? She found it. We continued to interrogate the witness. We got complete descriptions of the trio, their physical appearance and their method of operation matched those of the gang Frank and I have been looking for for the past six weeks. Alice Evans was shown mug shots of known shoplifters, but she was not able to give us an identification. We made arrangements for her to come down to the office and check additional mug files. 
The average citizen looks at shoplifting as a petty nuisance which businessmen are expected to endure. This is not entirely true. Shoplifting is big business. Last year, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of merchandise was stolen from stores in the Los Angeles area alone. Most of the goods stolen by organized gangs is sold to fences for final disposal. During the course of our investigation, we've been working with Stores Protective Association, incorporating all of the security officers in the larger businesses. M.O. bulletins had been gotten out on the gang's activities. From what we'd been able to find out, there were three people working as a unit, two women and a man. The three suspects would enter a store and split up. One of the women would pretend to be looking at merchandise, while the other two suspects would engage the clerk in conversation, in that way keeping her away from the first member of the trio. The articles stolen were almost always either coats or suits, and we noticed that one line of merchandise seemed to attract the criminals more than others. Monday, 3.46 p.m., Frank and I went down to a second-hand clothing store on 5th Street to talk to the owner. Be right with you. Toby? Yeah. Hi, fellas. What's going on? Oh, we got some things I want to talk to you about, Toby. Sure, just having a cup of coffee in the back. Come on, I'll pull you a cup. Fine, uh, thank you. In here? Yeah, sit down. Get you some java. Thanks. Anything special? No, we're just fishing, Toby. Thought you might be able to come up with a little something for us, maybe. And here you go. Either of you want sugar? No, no. No, oh, thanks. Don't use it. Just doing part of your work here. Is that right? Yeah, buy sheets. Want to get in the mail tonight. Well, we don't want to keep you, Toby. Yeah, no trouble, Sergeant. Max getting a little tired anyway. Just soon stop and have a cigarette. How's business? Pretty good? They're keeping up. Now, what can I do for you? You got anything on a boosting gang working around? Nothing more than usual. Why? Well, we got a bunch that's giving us a little trouble. We're trying to come up with something that'll hang together on them. Two men and a woman? Yeah. You got anything on them? Oh, nothing worth repeating. Rumbled around about the three of them. That's about it. If I had any more, I'd have called you sooner. Where's the information coming from? Well, you know how it is, Sergeant. You hear something here, something else there. You put them together. You come up with a story, but no way to trace it. Yeah, I know. You got any idea where the stuff is being sold? Same answer. Rumble's got it that all the loot's being shipped out of town. Some it back east, some goes up north. I got a piece the other day that some of it's going to Mexico. Mexico, huh? Yeah. Most of it's ending up in the east, though. You know any reason they'd be hitting one brand more than the others? You got a word. That's about all. What's that? The gang's laying it out around town that they'll pay up to 25 bucks for a suit. You know, going price is around five, maybe six and a half. Mm-hmm. Figures that if you can do better with one line, that's what you're going to boost. Huh. Why has the price gone up? Yeah, the only way I can figure it is that they're worth more in the market. Anybody approached you? Nah, if they had, you'd have been called right away. You know that. Yeah. You got any idea where we might be able to pick up anything on the trio? Not right out, but I'll tell you one thing. What's that? Oh, yeah, I got it. There's four of them. Yeah? Two men, two women. A man's a gun. He sets up the deals, makes a shipment. How are they getting the stuff out, Toby? Do you know? Pick up a kid and offer him a trip. Ask him to deliver a suitcase. Works out good for him. Carrier doesn't know who he's working for. Can't lead the cops back to the operation. Mm-hmm. About the only way I can figure it. You say none of the stolen stuff showing up down here? Mm-hmm, nothing so far. Well, thanks a lot, Toby. If you hear anything, we'd sure appreciate a call. Sure thing. Real good coffee, Toby. Instant. I make it in the percolator. Well, you mean that powdered stuff? You don't have to make that in the coffee pot. Habit, I guess. <laughs> well, thanks again. We won't keep you, Toby. Oh, hang on a minute. All right. Yes, sir? What can I do for you? Buy used clothes? Yes, sir. What have we got to sell? That's in the car. I just want to be sure you're buying stuff. Well, bring it in. We'll take a look at it. Okay, Toby. We'll see you later, huh? Right, Sergeant. Give me a call. Right. I'll be right back. Excuse me. Yeah. Well, what do you think of that, Sergeant? Sure in a hurry, isn't he? Yeah, let's see why. Come on. Yeah. You see him? Yeah. Right up there. Hey, hold it up there. Huh? What do you want? What's the matter? Didn't you hear me? I asked you to wait back there. Well, sure, I heard you. I didn't know you were talking to me. What do you want? Police officer. You want to step over to the car? I want to ask you a couple questions. Well, I haven't done anything. You didn't say you did. Well, why do you want to talk to me? What do you want me to come Come on, let's go. All right. I'm making a mistake. I haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. Got the wrong man. You got no reason to talk to me. All right. Get in. All right, sit still. What are you doing? You won't find anything. I don't know what you guys are after. I haven't done anything. Take your wallet out. Why? Take it out. Here. Take the money out of it. You always carry that much money, do you? 
No, not always. I know. You keep the money in your hand. Give me the wallet. Hey, yeah. Uh... Is this your true name? Hmm? Kenneth Elgin Norris. Is this your right name? Yeah. You live here now, do you? No, not now. Where do you live? I got a room over on 7th. You want me to run a make on it? Yeah, will you? Here. Here's his ID. Oh, thanks. And while they run the make, we'll take a break. From April 27th, 1954, Dragnet here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. We'll take a look at the news from 69 years ago today and have the conclusion of Dragnet following these words from your favorite station. Classic Radio Theater family, you know our friend Mike Lindell has a passion to help everyone get the best sleep of your life. He didn't stop by just creating the best pillow. He created the best bed sheets ever. They look and feel great, which means an even better night's sleep for me because, you know, I'm working like 67 hours a day. Now, Mike's offering the best deal on his Giza Dreams bed sheets ever. You can get a set of Giza sheets for as low as $29.98. You'll never want to sleep on anything else once you sleep slept on a set of Giza Dream sheets. A special offer for you right now. You can get a set of Giza sheets for as low as $29.98. Call 1-800-928-4715. Use the promo code WYATT or go to MyPillow.com. Use the promo code WYATT. It's good on anything on the website. That number again, 1-800-928-4715. Use my promo code WYATT. Thank you for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox here on your favorite station. We're listening this hour to an episode of Dragnet starring Jack Webb, The Big Lift, as it was originally broadcast on Tuesday, April 27th, 1954. In the newspapers of that Tuesday, some seven, 69 years ago, these were some of the headlines. <laughs> An open hint that Secretary of the Army Stevens might have tried to buy off an investigation by Senator McCarthy, the Republican of Wisconsin, brought a shouted denial by McCarthy yesterday that he has never been bought off by anybody or ever will. Some speculators burst into applause. Senator McClellan, the Democrat of Arkansas who touched out the exchange, shouted back at McCarthy. The uproar, the sharpest and noisiest to date in three days of televised public hearings in McCarthy's dispute with high Pentagon officials. It came after the Secretary Stevens on the witness stand acknowledged asking McCarthy to suspend hearings on alleged espionage at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, but branded as an unequivocal lie McCarthy's charge that he tried to switch the investigation to the Air Force and the Navy. President Eisenhower expressed hope yesterday that the Geneva Conference can reach at least a temporary settlement of explosive east-west differences in Asia, including the bloody Indochina War. But American officials fearing the early collapse of Dien Bien Phu were reportedly urging study to possible ways to keep the fall of the fortress from opening the way to a major communist onslaught in Indochina. Russian Premier Zhezhi Malenkov warned yesterday that if the West attacks Russia with atomic bombs, it will be crushed by the same weapon. Malenkov charged that the U.S. and its allies are maintaining an atmosphere of war hysteria and threatening the world with a hydrogen bomb. In a speech before the Soviet of Nationalities, which coincided with the opening of the Asiatic Peace Conference in Geneva, Malenkov accused the U.S. of provoking the extension of the war in Indochina. An Army court-martial yesterday threw but one of the remaining charges against Corporal Edward S. Dickinson, the turnabout Korean War prisoner, on a defense motion. It dropped a charge that Dickinson reported to his Red Captors that Martin Christensen of Hammond, Indiana, a former fellow prisoner, had a loaded pistol. 
but the court rejected the defense move to drop another charge that Dickinson informed the enemy about the escape plans of another fellow POW. The Crackers Neck Virginia Mountain Boy also is charged with collaborating with the communists in propaganda efforts. A children's court judge ruled yesterday that Rita Hayworth's two young daughters had been neglected but said it wasn't the red-haired actress's fault. Judge George W. Smythe decided after a two-hour closed hearing that Miss Hayworth could retain custody of Rebecca Wells 9 and Princess, uh, Princess Yasmin Khan 4, but she must not take them out of New York State. Smythe said after conferring with the actress and attorneys for the children and their fathers, Prince Ali Khan and actor Orson Welles, that Rita was a loving and devoted mother. But he said charges of the children had been neglected while Miss Hayworth and her fourth husband, singer Dick Hames, vacationed for two weeks in Miami were justified. He did not state who had neglected the girls. Mrs. Linwood Oglesby, employed in an attorney's office on the 20th floor of a Memphis building, looked up as a woman entered in cons to consult the lawyer. Mrs. Oglesby said, did you walk up, asking jokingly, recalling she hadn't heard the elevator stop. Yes, am replied the woman. You see, I have heart trouble, and my doctor doesn't want me riding in any elevator. And in Fort Worth, police figure they have clinching evidence against a 22-year-old plumber arrested for driving intoxicated. At the station, the man removed his hat, and a young possum stood on his head, man saying it was his pet. Police wrapped the possum in a towel to keep it warm. The man's cooling off in a jail cell. And though some of the day's top news stories as reported in the newspapers of Tuesday, April 27th, 1954 on your radio Dragnet, which continues now on Classic Radio Theater. 1K80 to Control 1. 1K80 to Control 1. Control 1 to 1K80, go ahead. Check for 1. Kenneth Elgin Norris. That's N-O-R-R-I-S. Male white American, 26 years, 5 feet 10 and 3 quarters, 168 pounds, Black hair, brown eyes. KMA 367. 1K80, oh, Roger, stand by. What's all that about? Checking to see if you're wanted in place. Oh. You ever been in trouble? Me with the cops? That's right. No, never. Why'd you leave the clothing store in such a hurry? I remembered I had to meet a guy. I remembered I was late. Who's the guy? A friend of mine. You wouldn't know him. Well, try us. It's a guy named Arthur. I don't know his last name. Where were you going to meet him? A bar down the street. What about the clothes you wanted to sell? What about it? Where are they? I don't know. Well, you went in to sell something that you didn't have. Is that it? Well, I was going to pick him up from Arthur. You don't know his last name? No. How come you were going to sell the clothes? Huh? Why were you going to sell the clothes? Well, that's a silly question. Why does anybody sell anything? Because I needed the money. You look like you're sitting pretty good. Well, i got to leave town. I'm selling all my stuff. I thought you said the clothes belong to this Arthur guy. Well, they do, but I'm going to sell them for him. He said he'd give me a piece of the profit. Why doesn't he sell them himself? Well, I don't know. You better ask him. We'll try to. Now get the rest of the stuff out of your pocket. Come on, everything. Ah, you guys are making a big mistake. You know that, don't you? A real big mistake. Well, if we're wrong, we'll tell you. Yeah. Here it is. Comb. Change, cigarettes, and a lighter. That's all there is. You sure? Well, why would I lie? Turn your pockets inside out. What? Turn them inside out. All right. All of them. The other one, too. Told you I gave everything I had. There isn't anything else. Oh. What's that? Huh? Move your foot. <clears throat> What's this? Looks like a key. What's it for? Well, I don't know. It isn't mine. Well, maybe it belongs to Arthur. It could be. It isn't mine. Looks like a check locker key, doesn't it? It might be. I never saw it before. It came out of your pocket, didn't it? No, it didn't. Must have been on the floor all the time. It isn't mine. 1K80, your suspect has a felony record including burglary and is now wanted for parole violation. 1K80, Roger. KMA 367. Thought you said you'd never been in trouble. I made a mistake. Looks like you made more than one, doesn't it? What? Maybe you're wrong about the locker key. I told you. I never saw it before. Oh, sure. You want to sit with him, Frank? Yeah. I'll get to a phone. All right. It's just a key. What does that prove? I don't know. Let's find out what it opens. <laughs> We got the location of the locker, and with the suspect, Frank and I drove over and removed a large black suitcase. The locks on the case had been broken, and inside we found 11 women's suits of the same type that had been stolen from the Los Angeles stores. All identifying labels had been removed, but we were able to find the tag issued by the National Recovery Board inside the seams of the suits. We got in touch with their Los Angeles office, and they told us that the serial number had been issued to a San Francisco company. On the way back to the city hall, we stopped and searched the suspect's room thoroughly, but we found nothing. 
When we got to the squad room, Frank went to the business office to arrange a phone call to San Francisco, and I took the suspect to the interrogation room. 6.20 p.m. You guys got to believe me. That stuff's not mine. I don't know where it came from. Where'd you get the key? Well, it's not mine. I never saw it before. Well, that's kind of hard to buy. Well, I don't care if you want it or not. That's the way it is. Tell us a little more about this, Arthur, will you? I told you everything I know. Where'd you meet him? In a bar down on Maine. I told you that before. Now, what's the matter? Don't you believe me? You're making it tough to believe. I'm telling you the truth. Where'd the suits come from? I don't know. All right, here. Take another look at them. Might help you remember, huh? They were in the suitcase when Arthur gave them to me. That's all I know. Where'd he get them? I don't know. Did he steal them? Well, I don't know. Why'd he give them to you? He just said he wanted me to take care you of them. You told us before he wanted you to sell them, didn't you? Well, he did. Where were you going to make the payoff after they were sold? He said he'd get in touch with Where? Me. Around. He said he'd find me. He gave you over $500 worth of suits, and he said he'd get in touch with you, huh? That's right. When? Sometime. He didn't name a date? No, just said he'd look me up. How many times have you been arrested? You got the record. Why are you asking me? We want you to tell us. I don't know. I forget. We'll take a guess. Oh, a few times. Five. You got the record. When's the last time you checked with your parole officer? I forget. You know your packages tab? No, I didn't know until I heard it on the radio. You had no idea, huh? No. You went up for burglary, is that right? Yeah, they sent me up to the joint. You know you're going back, don't you? Yeah, I guess. It's not going to look good to have another charge marked on you. What do you mean? Burglary. How'd you dig that one up? These suits? If you can't explain them, it isn't going to look too good, is it? Look, I told you, Arthur gave them to me. And he said he'd get in touch with you. Yeah, that's right. Sure. Come up with the answers yet? Says he doesn't know them. Yeah? Maybe we can help. Hmm? Just got through talking with a Georgia writer up north. Yeah. He checked the records, code numbers, from the shipment to the Whitfield department store. Looks like the bunch we're after. Now, who's Arthur? You mean the suits were stolen? You called it. Who's Arthur? Look, I don't want to go back to the joint in a beef like this. We don't decide that. But if I help you guys, you'll take care of me. You'll talk to my parole officer. I officers. can't make any deals with you. Yeah, but I don't want to fall this way. That's up to you, mister. You're sitting in the middle. Now, which way do you want to go? Nobody can help you but yourself. Miss Arthur must be a fine friend, leaving you with a bunch of stolen merchandise. Might be the way you figured it. What's the matter? Doesn't Arthur like you? Okay, I'll go the route. No. I'll tell you where to find him. Listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Tuesday, April 27th, 1954, Dragnet on this Thursday Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. We'll wrap up this week of Classic Radio Theater with an episode of Broadway Is My Beat starring Larry Thor from 72 years ago, April 28, 1951, the Georgia Gray murder case. Georgia Gray has been knifed in a taxi dance ballroom. She was killed by a guy who bought $5 worth of tickets. Well, that'll be coming up on tomorrow's Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Dragnet had a really strong uh, night uh, to be there. Uh, at, that, at this point in time, uh, its lead-in was Dinah Shore and Frank Sinatra in a musical, two musical shows, quarter-hour shows. Then Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator, starring William Gargan. Then Dragnet at 9, Crime and Peter Chambers at uh, 9.30. And then Fibber McGee and Molly in a quarter hour at 10. Uh, over on CBS, you had Art Link Letter, People Are Funny at 8, Mr. and Mrs. North, and then John Lund as yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in the still the half hour shows, then my friend Irma and Luella Parsons. So that was the big competition, don't you know? Let's get back to the conclusion of Dragnet uh, from 69 years ago, April 27th, 1954. He called a stenographer, and Kenneth Norris gave us a complete statement. He said that he'd been approached by a man that he knew only as Arthur and asked to carry a suitcase to St. Louis. Once there, a man would have him paged at the airport and take the valise from him. In return for this service, the suspect was to be paid $100 and his expenses. Norris explained that he decided he could do better by selling the contents of the suitcase himself. This information was forwarded to the St. Louis Police Department. We got a complete description of the man he knew as Arthur, and had the suspect check through the mug books, but he wasn't able to make an identification. We got in touch with his parole officer and told him that we had Norris in custody. We asked that we be allowed to detain him for a few days. The following morning, we met with Chief of Detectives Thad Brown and Captain Welsh. It was decided that Norris would take us to the bar where he'd met the thief and he'd point him out. Norris would then be brought back to the main jail and booked, and I would try to establish myself with this Arthur. In that way, we'd have a better chance of building a case that we could take to court and apprehending the entire shoplifting gang. 
On Wednesday morning, September 22nd, Norris, Frank, and I drove over to Main Street. We checked the bar, but the suspect wasn't there. We waited in our car, which was parked down the street. Arthur failed to arrive. He didn't show up at the bar on Thursday or Friday. Saturday, 12.40 p.m., Norris pointed down the street. There, that's him just going in the place. Fell in the gray suit there? Yeah, that's him. You sure? I got no reason to lie, have I? All right, Frank. Yeah. You want to take Norris back to the office? I'll go on in. Okay. I'll be right back. All right. Sergeant? Yeah. I'll give you something for free. Yeah, what's that? Take it easy with Arthur. Don't press. How do you mean that? He's a pretty rough guy. That's so? Yeah, I hear he carries a gun. Be a lot of trouble if he's got it with him. Not unless he tries to use it. I left Frank at the curb and walked into the bar. I saw the man that we knew as Arthur sitting at the rear of the place. I took a seat near the front door and ordered a cup of coffee. In a few minutes, I walked back toward Arthur. Something you want? Yeah, I wondered if I could have one of your cigarettes there. There's a machine up front. Well, if I had the price, I'd have bought a pack coming in. All right. Here. Got a match? How you fix for breath? Look, I just asked you for a cigarette. If you don't want to give me one, say so and I'll shove off. Never mind. Here's your match. Thank you. Hey, you. Yeah. You're broke, huh? All the way. Just get in town? This morning. Where from? Up north. Narrow it down. Look, mister, here's your cigarette bag. Give me one of these. Doesn't tell you about my life story. You hungry? I haven't eaten for two days. Here. Thanks. Appreciate this. How long are you going to be in town? Well, depends on how things work out. You got a job? Well, I'm going to look. What do you do? Whatever pays. Tell you what. No? Well, I got some friends around town. Might be able to use you. Check with me in a couple of days. Might be able to do something for you. Well, how do I get in touch with you? Meet me here. I tag the place a couple times a week. Just ask if Arthur's around. That's your name? That's what I'm using this season. You look me up, kid. We'll work something out. Yeah, I'm sure we will. I sat and talked to Arthur for another half hour. During that time, he wouldn't tell me his last name, and I had no way of finding out anything more about him. At 12.10, I saw Frank drive by the front door. That was the signal that the crew of detectives were standing by to follow the suspect. I left the bar and walked down Main Street up to 7th. Frank was waiting for me. We drove back to the city hall and discussed what had happened with Chief Brown and Captain Welsh. During the next three days, Arthur was kept under constant surveillance. He didn't drive an automobile. He contacted no one. We were able to learn a considerable amount about the man. Although he didn't try to make contact with any other members of the gang, it was obvious that he was the prime fence and that he was directing the operation. Wednesday afternoon, I walked into the bar on Main Street. Arthur wasn't there, but the bartender said that he was expecting him. I waited. At 6.47 p.m., the suspect entered the place. He took a seat at the rear of the bar and motioned me back. Hi. I've been looking for you. All right. Yeah. wonder if you've been able to come up with that job you were talking about. I could sure use a touch. You like to travel? What? I think it might have something for you. You've got to go out of town, though. For dough? I wouldn't ask you any other way. Well, what do I have to do? A friend of mine has a suitcase he wants to deliver to a party in Chicago. Why didn't he send it by mail? Doesn't want it to go that way. He wants it delivered personally. Well, what's it pay? All your expenses and a hundred bucks. No. What's in the suitcase? That isn't any of your business. What happens if I get picked up? I don't know. I'm not carrying anything hot. You got to take my word for it, Gene. All right. Who do I deliver the suitcase to? I'll meet you in the morning. I'll give you the bag then. You catch the 10 o'clock plane. When you land at Chicago, go to the coffee shop. You'll be paged. Meet the man and give him the suitcase. Well, how do I know if it's the right guy? We'll give you the name. He's the only one who knows what the name is and when you're coming in. All right. Where do I meet you? Be out in front of this place at 8 in the morning. I'll pick you up. Just one more thing. How about the money? You won't need any going back. When you turn over the suitcase to my friend, he'll give you the 100. You already have your ticket. All right. Sounds okay. Not as permanent as I'd like. You carry this off, we'll be able to do more business. Well, I'll meet you here then at uh, 8 in the morning, is that right? Right. Be on time. I don't want you to miss that plane. A lot depends on this deal. I don't want anything to go wrong. Now, don't worry. What? Neither do I. I left the bar and met Frank. We stood by the front of the place, and at 9.56 p.m., the suspect came out. He called a cab, and we followed him. We went out to the apartment where we knew he lived. Frank and I waited out front. At 11.20, a car pulled up in front of the place, and three people got out. They matched the description of the thieves in our shoplifting operation. They were carrying a large suitcase. We waited for 10 minutes, and then Frank and I went up to Arthur's apartment. Number 408, huh? Yeah. It's 
Down this way. Uh-huh. I get the door. Wait a minute. All right? Yeah. Who is it? Just a minute. What are you doing here? What's this all about, Art? Police officers, you're under arrest. Stand still. Oh, cop, a lousy cop. Should have known. I thought I could trust you. I thought you were honest. Yeah, you sure pick him. A cop for a messenger boy. You're real smart. I thought I could depend on him. I thought he was honest. You don't know what the word means. How about it, mister? Huh? Do you? The story you've just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 18th, trial was held in Department 97, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. Arthur Nelson Thompson, Samuel Donald Hickok, Georgia Baxter Nielsen, and Dorothy Marie Simpson were tried and convicted of burglary in the second degree, 14 counts. They received sentence as prescribed by law. Burglary in the second degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period not less than one, nor more than 15 years. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to thank the editors of Cosmopolitan Magazine for this month's pictorial feature on Jack Webb and Dragnet. Cosmopolitan, the May issue... On your newsstands tomorrow. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Jack Crucian, Alice Bacchus, Ralph Moody, Herb Ellis. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. April 27, 1954, Dragnet on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, our webpage, classicradio.stream. You can stream our shows on demand, 21 hours of Classic Radio Theater each and every week. We also have, uh, you can find our social media links there. You can learn how to build a classic radio collection of your own. And if you'd like to help us, you can uh, buy me a coffee. That buy me a coffee money helps us acquire additional classic radio collections and keep our distribution channels up and running. That's at classicradio.stream. Tell all your friends the greatest radio shows of all time are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station.